multiplication. Where do I begin? Let's take a trip in the Wayback Machine, shall we? When I first learned times tables in elementary school, it gave me just a smidgen of complete abject terror. My biggest difficulty was that they tried to get us to memorize the times tables, not learn them. I am garbage at memorization. I can remember things just fine, but throw a random piece of information at me without context, and my brain just immediately jettisons it. That's the difference between remembering and memorizing. Context. To remember is to see how one memory fits into the broader landscape of recollection. To memorize is to just retrieve one memory in isolation, without meaning or relation to anything else. To me, memorized facts are just noise, just static. I will never understand how the other kids were able to learn this stuff. Our exercises consisted of the whole class just saying the times table out loud in this zombie-like, flat, joyless monotone. It's like I missed the memo that said that the school was revising its curriculum to include less intuition and more turning us all to chanting cultists. Were the other kids remembering products by what sound they made? Was that why we had to repeat them by murmuring them over and over again like this echoing choir of the damned? No, that couldn't be it. We said every product out loud the exact same way. Same pitch, same rhythm, same tempo. 8 times 3 is 24. 8 times 4 is 32. Metric feet are really dull. The sound of the words offered no way of checking whether the words were right or if they even make sense. 8 times 5 is 85. Brain times swine is ham on ride. You know that feeling when you're in a crowd and you try to sing along to a song where you don't know the words, so your only choice is to mumble and hope that nobody can hear you? Yeah, that's what my math classes were like. For four years! My teachers even tried getting me to learn products by using flashcards. Flashcards? Did they not just catch my whole diatribe on how fragile and unreliable memorization is? To me, learning multiplication with flashcards was like trying to learn geography without a map. Oh, you don't know where Shipnell is? It's just east of Telford. Oh, you don't know where Telford is? It's just south of Donington. Oh, you don't know where Shipnell is? It's just east of Telford. Let's just east of Telford. Newport. Well, it's just south of Donington. Newport. All south of Telford. All south of Telford. Oh my sight! Shut up! I don't need facts in isolation. What I need is an overview of multiplication. What I need is a map. Alright, I gotta come clean here. I have a map for multiplication, but it's sort of like those early 1500s maps that European explorers made of the Americas. You know, the coastlines are pretty well documented, but then you start to move inland, and it kind of becomes guesswork, and finally there's some completely uncharted territories that just got plastered over with spooky warnings like, here be dragons, or some sh now, I did research alternative methods for multiplication before making this video, but what I've found is that those aren't too useful for multiplying small numbers together. So while I do want to talk about them, and yell a lot about why conventional multiplication sucks, I'll have to save that rant for next time. Alright, let's get right to it. Some schools make you learn the 10x10 10 10 grid, some use the 12x12. 12 12. We'll start off with the 10x10 10 10 for now. Now, I know this looks like a lot, but keep in mind that multiplication is what you'd call a commutative operation. 3 times 4 is the same thing as 4 times 3, so almost half the entries on this grid are just repeats. Okay, you probably already know how to do the small numbers, so let's get them out of the way right quick. 1 times any number is just that number, so 1 times 3 is 3, 1 times 4 is 4, yada yada yada. You know this already, why am I telling you this? 2 times any number is just that number added to itself, so 2 times 3 is 3 plus 3 is 6, 2 times 4 is 4 plus 4 is 8, and so on. For the bigger multiples like 2 times 7 and 2 times 8, I always ended up cracking the numbers against each other when I added them in my head. Yes, somehow, after all these years of school, I still break an 8 apart into a 2 and a 6 when I do 8 times 2 in my head. Don't judge me. Okay, let's jump to the other side of the map. 10s are pretty handy to know because we count numbers using what's called a base 10 counting system. What that means is that each digit can take one of 10 different values, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, before you have to move to the next decimal place. We're gonna abuse that fact maliciously to get three sleazy underhanded tricks to help out here. For 10s, you just put a zero at the end. 7 times 10 is 70, 8 times 10 is 80. Tell me something I don't know, Alex! Okay, okay. When you multiply something by 9, you're really just multiplying by 10 minus 1, right? So as you make bigger and bigger products of 9, the 10s place keeps going up by 1, and the 1s place keeps going down by 1. It just so happens that you can keep track of this in your hands. If you want to do 9 times 3, put down your third finger. You have two fingers to the left of the one you just dropped, so your tens place is a 2. You have seven fingers on the right, so the ones place is a 7. So 9 times 3 is 27. 
If you do 9 times 4, you put down your fourth finger and get 3, 6, 36. 9 times 5 gets you 45. 9 times 6 gets you 54. 9 times 7 gets you 63. You get the idea. My sister taught me how to do this when I was in third grade, and I still do products in 9 this way. Okay, when you multiply something by 5, you're really just multiplying it by 10 halves, right? So when I need to multiply something by 5, I'll just have it, and then when I'm done, I'll move the decimal point one spot over. So to do 6 times 5, I'll just have 6 to get 3, so my answer is 30. To do 7 times 5, have 7 to get 3.5, the answer is 35. 8 times 5, have 8, that's 4, so 40. 9 times 5, have 9, 4.5, that's 45, and so on. Okay, two things to note here. First of all, you'll see that some of these rules overlap. For example, you could do 5 times 2 either by adding 5 to 5, or by having 2 and moving the decimal point. This is why having a lot of rules can be a good thing. There are sometimes many different approaches to the same problem, and you're free to pick which one you find easiest. You do you. That expression makes me want to hurt myself. The other thing to note is, wow, we've already filled out three quarters of this grid. Good deal. The bad news? Most of the tricks I've found for multiplying the remaining numbers, the products of 3, 4, 6, 7, and 8, all kind of suck. So I'm going to call the first five rules we just did the strong rules, and the next two the weak rules. For 3 times 3, I always pictured this group of boxes, 3 wide by 3 tall, and that makes it easy for me to think of the number 9 for some reason. I guess in theory you could do any product by imagining what it looks like as a certain number of boxes wide by a certain number of boxes tall, and then identifying the shape you get with a particular number, but in practice I just can't picture very big products in my head this way. I do know that if you had to make, for example, a rectangle that's 7 boxes wide by 7 tall, it would make a square, but that's not because I can picture what it looks like, it's because I know that any rectangle that's as wide as it is tall will make a square. That's why when we multiply a number by itself, we call the answer a square number. As for 3 times 4, I just used another cheap memory trick for that. 1, 2, 3, 4. 12 is 3 times 4. Just dirty, sleazy mnemonics here. 3 times 5 is already taken care of by our 5 rule, so that just leaves 3 times 6, 7, and 8. For these 3, I take advantage of the fact that 3 times a number is just that number plus its double. So 3 times 6 is 6 more than 12. 3 times 7 is 7 more than 14. 3 times 8 is 8 more than 16. And yeah, I add the pieces together by number cracking where I have to. So after all these years, I'm still doing 8 times 3 by playing this stupid little animation in my head. I make no apologies. This rule is only helpful if you're already good at multiplying by 2. And it involves number cracking. And I tend to screw these products up way more often than others. And I only use it for the 6s, 7s, and 8s. So yeah, it's a weak rule. For 4 times 4, I picture a group of boxes 4 wide by 4 tall. Or at least I try to. I can barely picture what this looks like in my head, so that's how I know it's the number 16. It's the square that's just too big for me to picture all at once. For the other products of 4, 4 times 6, 7, and 8, the rule I use is to double stuff twice. So 4 times 6 is twice 12, 4 times 7 is twice 14, and 4 times 8 is twice 16. Again, the same disadvantages as the 3s here. This is only helpful if you're good at multiplying by 2, it can be kind of tricky, and it's only useful for a handful of cases. Okay, you know how I said that my rules for 3s and 4s were kind of weak and wouldn't be helpful to very many people? Well, you'll be happy to know that my rules for the 6s, 7s, and 8s are really weak, and are helpful to absolutely nobody but me because they rely on random and very specific childhood memories I formed while I was learning the times tables. But maybe my memories will help you to form some of your own? Or maybe you'll just laugh at me for being weird, I don't know. When I was a kid growing up, you only watched two TV channels. You put on MTV when your sisters were in the room because you wanted them to think you were cool, and you put Nickelodeon on the second they were gone because cartoons are awesome. MTV was channel 56, and hey, look at that. On the remote control, the numbers go 5, 6, 7, 8. 56 is 7 times 8? Eh? Eh? Another dirty mnemonic trick. And to make things easier, Nickelodeon was on channel 49, so you learn to get good at hopping back and forth between 56 and 49 on the remote, and hey, look at that. You can hop back and forth between 56 and 49 on the times table, too, since they're right next to each other. One is 7 times 8, the other is 7 times 7. Now, if I had been really thinking, I could have said that the TV is right next to the Nintendo 64, so 49 and 56 are right next to 64. Except, of course, that we didn't have an N64 when I was in second grade like all the other kids, because instead of pretending to blow up KGB weapons factories over and over, I was supposed to spend my childhood on boring stuff like self-cultivation and character building, and developing a unique personality that would serve me well in my adulthood. Pfft. How do you do 6 times 7? Well, 6 is just 2 times 3, so you can group the 3 and the 7 together to make 21. Then, instead of doing 6 times 7, you can just do 2 times 21 instead to get the answer 42. That would have been a great way of doing it. That was not how I learned to do it.
I learned it by more random childhood memories of television. The BBC did a TV miniseries on Douglas Adams' books, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm gonna spoil the whole thing now. In the series, the supercomputer calculates that the answer to life, the universe, and everything is... 42! I laughed my ass off at that for so long that it became impossible for me to forget, especially because there were six episodes in the miniseries and I was seven years old. Six, seven, forty-two. Wait, you watched the Hitchhiker's Guide TV series when you were seven years old? Yes, I had a weird childhood, okay? Douglas Adams was funny, and funny is a lot easier to remember than repetitive and boring. I eventually learned to do the product of six and eight by thinking of it as five plus one times eight, because I had finally become comfortable with the product five times eight is forty. I still think of six times eight as forty plus eight. What? I'm not ashamed, that one's hard. I did the same thing for six times six. I thought of it as five plus one times six to get thirty and six. At least that's how I started doing that one. I actually did manage to accidentally memorize the square numbers just because I did them like 15,000 times throughout my life. Me forming a memory is like a cave forming a stalagmite. It's repetitive, boring, and takes a couple thousand years to happen. All right, there is an alternate method for doing the products of six, seven, and eight that doesn't require forming random memories. You put both hands in front of you, palms up, and you assign a number to each finger. The pinkies are nines, ring fingers are eights, middle fingers are sevens, and so on. To multiply six times eight, you line up the six finger of your left hand with the eight finger of your right hand. Then you close those two fingers and all the ones below them. If you add together the fingers you have left sticking up, it gives you your tens place, four. If you multiply the folded down fingers on the left with the folded down fingers on the right, you get eight. So the answer is 48. Here's another example, seven times seven. Make your middle fingers line up, and the tens place is a four, and the ones place is nine. So the answer is 49. The only downsides here are that you have to use your hands, so it's a little slower, and also sometimes carrying is involved. If you want to do six times seven, for example, you get a three in the tens place and a 12 in the ones place. Whoops. So that really makes it 30 and 12, or 42. Kind of tricky, but maybe not as tricky as randomly memorizing stuff. All right, so that's the 10 by 10 grid finished. Five strong rules that cover most of it, two weak rules that cover some of it, and then a whole bunch of super convoluted rules and desperate memory tricks to mop up what's left. Now it turns out that figuring out the 12 by 12 grid isn't that much harder. Let's take a look at the 11s. For the 11s, all you need to do is write the same number twice. So 11 times 2, you just write two twos. 11 times 3, you just write two threes, and so on. All the way up to 11 times 9 as 99. 11 times 10 follows the same rule for all 10s. You just stick a zero at the end of 11. Now, for 11 times anything bigger than 10, there's a neat trick you can use. You can just drop the 10s digit to the left, drop the 1s digit to the right, and do the sum of both in the middle. So for 11 times 11, we drop a 1 to the left, drop the other 1 to the right, and we do 1 plus 1 to get 2 in the middle. So 11 times 11 is 121. You can do the same trick for 11 times 12. Drop the 1 to the left, the 2 to the right, and do the sum in the middle is 3, so 11 times 12 is 132. You can use this trick to multiply any two-digit number by 11. For 11 times 27, we drop the 2 to the left, the 7 to the right, and do 2 plus 7 in the middle to get 297. Sometimes there's carrying involved. For 11 times 38, we would do 3 on the left, 8 on the right, and... Uh, 11 in the middle. So after carrying, the answer becomes 418. Anyway, in school, they only make you learn the 12 times 12 table at most, so at this point we're just showing off. For the products of 12 and higher, all I ever do is split things into their 10s and 1s components and multiply them separately. So to do 12 times 7, I just think of that as 10 plus 2 times 7. So out loud, I'll say 7014 is 84. Another example, 56 times 24. I do that one as 120 is 120, so 1200, and 120, 24 is 144, so 1200, 144 is 1344. So basically it's just the same way that I do complicated addition and subtraction problems. I picture doing a little bit of calculation, say my intermediate results out loud so I don't forget them while I'm doing another calculation, and repeat until I'm either finished or totally lost. To do 8 times 136, I'll have to work on just one or two digits at a time. I'll pretend for a second that it's just 8 times 13, and so I'll say 80, 24, that's 104, then I'll tack on the extra zero, making it 1040. For the last step, I'll multiply 8 by 6 to get 48. So 1040, 48 is 1088, or 1088. That's about the limit of what I can do in my head. I can do a one-digit number times a two- or three-digit number, and I can maybe do a pair of two-digit numbers, but that's as far as I can get without having to rely on special memory tricks. More on that in the next episode.
Okay, so to summarize, for multiplying one-digit numbers, we've got five strong rules, two weak rules, and a whole bunch of random mnemonic devices to take care of the rest. For multiplying bigger numbers, we can break them down by multiplying one-digit numbers and then adding everything together. I feel the need to apologize here. That was an awful lot of talking for an awfully small number of revelations. Don't worry though, next episode I promise to share a whole bunch of new stuff that you've probably never even heard of. <laughs>